Good morning and welcome to worship at Mount Bethel Presbyterian Church and a special welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. We're so glad that we can worship God together no matter where we might find ourselves. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning, hear this poem from the Reverend Sarah R. Speed. Open hands. We are born with the ability to wrap our fingers around another, to hold tight to what we know. Maybe that's where the instinct comes from this clinging, this sinking, this holding on. Maybe that's why Peter cries, never, when Jesus must leave. From the very beginning, we've known how to hold tight. So I pray, open up my hands, uncurl my fingers one by one, loosen the grip that I hold unyielding. Remind me that birds must fly and children must grow and leaves must fall. And even though we are born with the ability to hold tight, we can learn how to love with open hands. Friends, let us worship God.
Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. On our worst days, God is good. On our best days, God is good. When life is consistent, God is good. When life turns on its head, God is good. Day and night, Monday through Sunday, God is good. God is here. God is love. Hold tight to that good news. Let us worship God. You may be seated. There's a moment in our scripture today when Jesus turns to Peter, named the rock of the church, and says, get behind me, Satan. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty bad day for Peter. It's a pretty bad day when Jesus calls you Satan. Fortunately, this absurd moment comforts me with the knowledge that even Peter made mistakes. Peter, who was given the keys to heaven, Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, made mistakes just like me, just like all of us. And still, Jesus chose him. Knowing that, let us speak honestly to God, for even on our worst days, we belong to God, and that will never change. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God. We often find ourselves moving through a world that does not make sense. Like Peter, we want to yell out, this should not happen. We want to control scenarios beyond our reach. We want to hold your world in our hands. Forgive us for the moments when we lead with declarations instead of curiosity. Forgive us for arguing when we could listen. 
Forgive us for fixating on one truth when we could open ourselves up to many. Soften our hard edges and teach us how to listen. With hope in our hearts, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. No matter how many times you have dug your heels in, no matter how many fights you have wanted to pick with God, no matter how many times you have disagreed, raged, or clung to what you know instead of embracing holy change, we worship a God of grace. Nothing can separate us from God's love, not even a stubborn attitude or a tense heart. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. As you speak, sorry, <laughs> Ooh, that's an instruction. Poor, uh, so hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God's love for us, see, everyone makes mistakes, and God is there, and grace, grace abounds. God's love for us will always be deeper than we can imagine. We are seen, we are loved, and we are forgiven. Now follow Peter and go be the church in this world. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite any kids who are here to come forward and any kids who are at home to gather around. Good morning. There you go. Good morning, friends. Um, all during Lent, we've been making fish. This is the fish you're going to make today. Um, what's the symbol on this fish? What's the symbol on this fish? Oh, you can't see it. It's, oh, interesting. Maybe what you're going to do, you're going to paint, and maybe the symbol will magically appear. How does Lisa do it? Some of us know the secrets, but we're not going to reveal the secrets because then that's no fun. <laughs> um, what is this symbol? I heard an adult behind me say it. Mason? It's a piano. It's a piano. Yeah, this is something we might see in piano practice if you're in band, if you sing in the choir. This is called a fermata. A fermata, what happens when you see this in music? You play the note a little longer. What is it? Yeah, you play the note a little longer, so like today Rodney's conducting, and so there's a couple of moments where we all know to look up and watch, because if we don't, there are consequences. We look up and we watch Rodney, and he tells us how long to hold the note, the fermata, and then we, we cut off when he tells us to. A fermata is kind of an interesting um, symbol for our, for our uh, fish today, but it's part of Peter's story too. Peter, in today's story, kind of gets stuck. He kind of holds out a note a little too long. He wasn't watching his conductor, which is Jesus. Um, and Jesus says, hey, dude, stay with me, man. Stay with me. Um, Peter, last week, hold on one second, Mason. Last week, Peter got it. Peter said, you are the Lord, the Messiah. And he kind of got stuck on that idea of what he thought the Lord and the Messiah should be. And so in today's text, 
Jesus says some things, and Peter says, no way, Lord, that can't be. I won't let that happen. And Jesus says, buddy, you need to stay with me. You're fixed on the wrong things. You're, you're holding that note out a little too long. You need to pay attention to me. So we, we, we learn these stories, but we also find ourselves in Peter. There are times when we might get stuck, when we might hold a note a little too long, and we need to be looking to Jesus as our conductor. Mason. Basically, which is, I think I know what you're trying to say. Yeah? Basically, basically Peter, you know, let's say Peter playing the piano. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Jesus is like, hey, there's only one fermata here. Stay with me, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We've been talking about faith journeys and how they are long and how sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's difficult, but we are all on journeys together. We're all listening and learning from Jesus, but we're doing that together as a faith community. All of these people are on the same, they're on their own journeys, but they're journeying with us. Sometimes it's hard to do this life of faith, And it's good to be reminded that we have this church together uh, to to lean on, to learn alongside each other, to pray for each other. So what I want you to do, I want you to look over here. Do you see what's on this wall over here? What are these? They look like quilts, yeah? They're a little bit smaller than quilts. Why don't you come on over here? Everyone, I want you to stand next to one of these and put your hand on one of them. These are prayer shawls. Do you remember when we ordained and installed our new officers? They all got, you can come down, whoops, you can come down here. Um, They all got a prayer shawl, and the idea is that they can put the shawl around their shoulders when times are kind of hard, and they can feel the love of our congregation supporting them. So all of our deacons got prayer shawls, and now our elders are going to get prayer shawls. Also, people who are maybe going through a rough time they can also get prayer shawls as a reminder that they don't journey alone. So today we're going to bless, we're going to bless these prayer shawls. Whoa. I'm good. Uh, there's a step there. Um, we're going to bless these prayer shawls. So put your hand on a shawl and close your eyes and pray with me. God, we're grateful for this community of faith, for the people who are on this journey alongside us. We pray that those who would feel these prayer shawls around their shoulders would feel our love and your love surrounding them and holding them tight when things seem unsure or scary. We pray that we would always be able to rely on you and to rely on each other on our journeys. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray for the spirit to illumine our minds and hearts. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Listening God, if we could attach ourselves to you, we would. To you but instead we wander. Instead of attaching ourselves to you, we find ourselves swept up in the business of the day. Like a seesaw of faithfulness, we move back and forth, up and down, constantly trying to find you in the midst of it all. So speak clearly to us now. Quite the distractions long enough to affix ourselves to your good news. We are listening. We are hungry. We are hopeful. Amen. Our Old Testament passage for today is Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 22. Listen now for God's word for you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And do not forget all of God's benefits. Who forgives all your inequity 
who heals all your diseases. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear the Lord, and the Lord's righteousness to children's children. To those keep the Lord's covenant, and remember to do the Lord's commandments. The Lord has established a throne in the heavens, and God's kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you God's angels, you mighty ones who do the Lord's bidding. Obedient to the Lord's spoken word. Bless the Lord, O God's host, the Lord's ministers that do the Lord's will. Bless the Lord, all the Lord's works, and all places of the Lord's dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Our New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. To quote the great Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again, isn't it, folks? Today's scripture passage, just three little verses in Matthew, occurs immediately after last week's text. Remember last week's story? The one where Jesus asks the big question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gives the big answer. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus, overjoyed by Peter's correct response, responds with his emphatic, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And then Jesus proclaims that because Peter gets it, Jesus is going to give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and upon Peter's great statement of faith, Jesus will build his church. It is a glorious moment. And then Peter puts his foot in his mouth yet again, and Jesus delivers his harshest admonition of Peter yet the famous, get behind me, Satan, line. Just a few verses after after Peter's big aha moment, and he's already messing up big time. The text begins with four ominous words. From that time on, it tells us that there's been a shift. Once Jesus decides to build his church upon Peter, once Peter truly understands who Jesus is, the whole tone of the gospel is going to shift. Everything from here on out is pointed towards Jerusalem and what will happen there. Every story, every interaction from here on out will be something that will play a role in Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, that triumphal entry, his arrest, his trial, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus knows what is coming, and he needs to prepare them. From that time on, Jesus begins to show the disciples what must happen, how he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. The text tells us that he begins to show them, not tell, not describe, but show Our Tuesdays with the text group spent some time wondering about that choice of words, show rather than tell. That would be a strange kindergarten assignment, show rather than tell. Just how did he accomplish his task? How was he able to show them rather than tell them? The text doesn't necessarily say, but it seems that Jesus knows that the message he's trying to communicate to the disciples is an urgent one. 
From that time on, as they continue following Jesus, witnessing his miracles, hearing his teachings, and observing interactions between their teacher and leaders of their faith tradition. As those interactions grow more and more tense, and they are witnesses to all of that, Jesus is trying to get them to fully understand, not just through words, but through actions, what all is about to go down in Jerusalem. It's got to be jarring. And even though Jesus includes the promise of resurrection after three days, for the disciples listening, it's a pretty horrific message. Jesus has come to mean so much to these disciples. From teacher or rabbi, he became a miracle worker, to Lord, to Messiah, and to friend. Not only is Jesus the Messiah, but he's come to mean so much to them relationship-wise. And now here their friend is telling them some pretty scary, grief-inducing stuff. And so, in a way, it's no wonder that Peter speaks up. I mean, of course he speaks up, it's Peter. But also, I don't blame him. You can almost picture the disciples pushing Peter out from among them, whispering to him, say something. You're the one with all the right answers. Say something. Tell him we'd never let that happen. Tell him to stop with all of that nonsense. And so Peter does. He pulls Jesus aside and says, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. I honestly don't blame Peter, and I might have been tempted to say something similar. Who wants to hear that their dearly loved friend is going to suffer, especially to the point of death? No one. But that's not the point. That's not why Jesus is here. Jesus is here on a mission, and the disciples don't get to dictate what that mission is. And so we get this famous statement from Jesus, get behind me, Satan. It's the same thing I said to my alarm clock this morning. <laughs> get behind me, Satan, Jesus admonishes. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is a reversal from just a few verses earlier that we heard in last week's text. In last week's text, when Peter realizes who Jesus is and proclaims that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus tells him, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Meaning, Peter can only have come about this realization through the Holy Spirit, through divine intervention. And here we are just a few days later, just a few verses later, and Peter has lost that divine connection. He's falling back on human logic and reason. In this moment, Jesus may be learning that Peter's idea of a Messiah and Christ's version of Messiah are two very different things. In his book, The Life and Witness of Peter, Larry Haler argues that Peter's profession of Jesus the Messiah indicates that he misunderstands Jesus' purpose. He writes, Peter almost certainly harbors nationalistic hopes for the Jesus movement. And in his commentary on Mark, James Edwards agrees, Peter has supplied the proper title, Messiah, but he has a wrong understanding. Jesus will don the servant's trowel rather than the warrior's sword. Peter's idea of the Messiah of a mighty warrior coming to free the people of God from the powers that were, that idea is quickly unraveling. And it's something that Jesus needs Peter to let go of. But Peter is reluctant, even stubborn, to do so. As the writers at A Sanctified Art point out, when your world unravels and your beliefs are tested, you may cling to what you know. As Jesus foretells his death and resurrection, Peter protests. Peter is fixed upon the way he thinks things should go. He resists the pain of what will come. But Jesus is fixed upon his calling, and so he calls Peter out. When your world unravels and your beliefs are tested, you may cling to what you know. How true this is for us as well. What do you cling to when things feel out of control? What do you hold tightly to 
when confronted with a new idea or opinion? What about the church? As the church built upon Peter changes in this 21st century, what are the things that we cling to instead of taking a step back and spending time in prayer to see what new thing God is up to and how we might work alongside God in this new thing? What are those things that we are so fixed upon that we can't see any other way? Canadian author and blogger Sarah Bessie released a book this week entitled Field Notes for the Wilderness, in which she unpacks and describes her journey from fundamentalist evangelicalism through deconstructing that faith through to the other side from which she emerged with what she calls an ever-evolving faith. It's a book meant to be a guide for those who also might find themselves in the wilderness of an evolving faith, a wilderness that might be scary at first and unwelcome at times. In her Field Notes book, she writes, there are a lot of reasons why folks like us find ourselves in the wilderness. And right now it's even feeling a bit crowded. We are in the midst of a shift in the church that has resulted in many of us here, outside the city gates, exhausted and scared, sad and angry, and yet just a little relieved. She points out a similar Peter-like tendency to cling to the things of the past, writing, the temptation when you found yourself here in the wilderness is to run for the nearest shelter of certainty you can find. It may be tempting to stay in the nearest shelter, or to stay in a certain mindset, or to rely on certain theology, even when you know deep within your soul that you're changing. Your relationship with God is changing. So what do we do? How do we know which things that we need to let go of? How do we know when it's time? And how in the world do we do it? Sarah Bessie describes a bit of that process and compares it to Marie Kondo's keep, toss, repurpose method from that horrible Spark Joy show. <laughs> Between you and me, I am not a huge Marie Kondo fan. She will never convince me to give up the stack of books next to my bed. But I like Sarah Bessie's version of Marie Kondo when it comes to our evolving faith journeys. There are some things in our faith journeys that will stay with us forever. There will be some things, though, that we will toss, and there will be some that get repurposed. She writes, as I've rummaged through what I believe over the years, and I've slowly figured out what needs to go and what needs to stay, I've certainly thrown out beliefs and practices and opinions that were no longer serving me or the world. And yet, she reflects, I have found myself reclaiming so much of what I thought I had outgrown, too. It turns out that many things I had once scorned were actually precious to me. Sometimes I've been surprised by what I've held on to, enchanted by their beauty once I was able to perceive these things from a new vantage point. An evolving faith doesn't mean we burn down everything that was once precious to us, Bessie concludes. There is something between everything and nothing. We aren't required to toss everything we were taught or given as worthless or useless or even toxic as we grow and change, becoming more fully ourselves. There is room to honor and hold space for the precious and meaningful, even as we evolve in our beliefs, our homes, and our lives. It's okay to bring some things with you, she writes. Over the past few weeks, we've talked a lot about our faith journeys, how it's more than okay to doubt, it's good, hard work, and how even a three-word sentence, Jesus is Lord, can speak volumes and is just as valid a faith statement as a three-page one. Last week, you worked on your own faith statements, and I was so impressed by how wide-ranging your statements were about Jesus. I saw familiar statements that I had heard and learned from Sunday school as a child. Jesus is my friend, my comforter. I saw statements that could be part of a Reformed Theology 101 discussion. (laughs) Jesus is my redeemer. Jesus is the revelation of God in human form. And then I saw those wilderness statements, 
or those statements that come out of an experience of some wilderness wanderings. Jesus is a complicated person. Jesus is our mother. And finally, Jesus is, I get more sure all the time that I don't know all the time. This faith business is hard work. If we're willing to accept that we're called to experience a life of evolving faith. But it's so worth it if we're willing to let go of some of our fixed notions of faith, if we're willing to let go and trust that this journey has purpose. Peter will continue to struggle to give up his fixed notions. A short time after today's text, Jesus will bring Peter with him up to a mountain to witness the transfiguration. It's yet another moment in which Peter's faith evolves as he sees Jesus transfigured before him, speaking with Moses and Elijah. Perhaps wanting to control the narrative still, Peter recommends a building project, constructing three buildings in which Jesus, Moses, and Elijah might dwell. It is good for us to stay up here, Lord, Peter tells Jesus. But God's voice breaks through Peter's idea. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Let go, Peter, God says. Let go of this idea of controlling what is to happen. Let go of who you think the Messiah will be. Let go and let your own faith be transfigured in the process. What do you need to let go of? We began worship today by hearing a poem from the Reverend Sarah R. Speed. I want to close the sermon by listening to that poem again. After all, it's always good to hear a poem twice. But this time while I read, I want you to clench your hands. Clench them tight. Feel your nails digging into your palms. Hold that tension until the poem directs you to begin releasing. As you hear these words, may you consider just what it is you need to let go of and just what it is you still need to cling to. So clench your hands and listen. We are born with the ability to wrap our fingers around another, to hold tight to what we know. Maybe that's where the instinct comes from, this clinging, this sinking, this holding on. Maybe that's why Peter cries, never, when Jesus must leave. From the very beginning, we've known how to hold tight. So I pray, open up my hands, uncurl my fingers one by one, loosen the grip that I hold unyielding. Remind me that birds must fly and children must grow and leaves must fall. And even though we are born with the ability to hold tight, we can learn how to love with open hands. All praise be to God. Amen.
having heard God's word read and proclaimed, let us rise in body or spirit and affirm what we believe using the affirmation of faith, which can be found in your bulletin. I believe in a God of second chances, a God who sees through my stubbornness and holds my fear with tenderness. I believe that this God of second chances uses ordinary people, Peter, to do good in the world. Therefore, I believe and hope God can use me too. I believe that from time to time, God invites us to imagine the impossible. I believe that from time to time, God invites us to change our minds. This change is holy and important work, although challenging. When fear and scarcity plague me, or when the impossible feels out of reach, I believe that God needs me with grace and invites me to follow. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. Today's prayers of the people were written by Reverend Baron Mullis. Please join me in prayer. Eternal God, our story together is one of your unending faithfulness to us, even as we are not always faithful to you. Holy source of all that is good, you have shown us yourself in abundance and mercy, in grace and abiding care. Knowing of your enduring providence, we may come to you with the concerns that weigh heavily on us. We pray for you for world affairs beyond our control, for the people of Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza. We pray for peace, knowing that you alone are the truth, a source of truth, shalom, peaceable kingdom. Where there are those in harm's way, we pray protection. Where we ourselves harbor enmity and prejudice, we pray awareness and grace that we may learn forgiveness. 
Teach us how we may serve you more fully in ways we can not imagine. We pray for needs closer to home, for our community. As we continue the season of Lent, we ask that you open our eyes to the needs on every doorstep. May we see those names are known to you and offer compassion and goodwill. We pray for victims and gun violence in particular. We offer our prayers for those who seek solutions for untractable problems. Let us not give up hope. Let us not abandon the work of healing the world. Remember that all healing comes from you. We pray as well for ourselves, our own material and spiritual needs. Where our members suffer from illness and affliction, grant your healing touch, bring in wholeness. For any in our midst who suffer from depression or addiction, give us understanding and compassion. For those who are lonely, may we be a place of friendship, a warm haven where love is shared. To that end, we pray for the church, universal, Presbyterian, and our own congregation. Enrich our lives with your grace that we might also be preparers of the breach. Hear us now as we lift our voices as one to pray the prayer your salt, your son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. From the providence of God, all that we need has been given to us in sufficient abundance that we might share. Let us return our offerings as a sign of our commitment to follow the one who has loved us, even unto death. Let us pray. Gracious God, from the overflowing of your love, we have been given abundance upon abundance. Receive, we pray, our offerings and bless them. May we be blessed by their work as we see your reign among us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
just a reminder that following worship, we will have a brief congregational meeting. Um, so I'll ask you to be seated during the postlude. If you would like to leave before the meeting, please leave after the postlude. Friends, as you go from this place, clench your fists, open them up. What needs to stay? What needs to be let go of? What needs to be restored? Know that in that process, in that journey, you do not do that alone, but you do that with Christ as your guide and with your fellow congregants, your fellow friends in Christ here. So beloved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you see and look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. You are called, you are blessed. In both your ups and downs, you belong to God. Go now in peace, go trusting that good news. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.